So, Matthews, it's great to be here. That's all the Portuguese I got for now. And yeah, we're going to talk about hydration, atoms, training, personal mobility, all mine. We should probably start. By the way, if at some point things feel like confusing, you'll probably find this emoji at the bottom of the slides and means let's discuss more after. So yeah, this is what we want to cover today. The best and the future of a lot of things in the web. We talk about, about items, resume mobility, uh, we'll discuss streaming plus server-side rendering and selective hydration. We'll talk about rec server components. And last but not least, we'll drop some closing thoughts on top of that. So that I know you, how many of you are here to be front end? Okay, I front end. Three X. Okay, cool. So I guess it all starts with the question, how and where if you want to render something. Because these days we can do things on the web server, on a build server in good time. Of course, you can always render stuff in the browser and also at the edge. Not to mention that we have different strategies. So we can do things, for, for example, hot cons, or go have strategies like partially or progressively rendering things. Not to mention a lot of questions we have. So where do we handle navigation? Is that on the server or from the client? And what is exactly executed when our page loads? And when do we do data fetching? And not to mention, like, what is included in our model or what is serialized and sent over the wire and so on. And even stuff like, when does our app become interactive? Because throughout the years, we got different metrics to evaluate that. So we had TTI, and then we also had first input delay or FID. Nowadays, we got INB, that is this new metric, new core web file introduced by Google. And yeah, it's, it's just a lot of questions we've got. And I wonder how we got here in the first place. Because I remember back in 2015, 16, 17, we were talking a lot about the JavaScript fatigue. And the decision making process at the time was mostly choosing whether we would go with React, Angular, or Build. So I guess to understand that, we've got to do a little bit of trip back in time thing, talk about the past. And one of the first things is when the servers started in the Swiss basements and all of that, all we had to do was disturb HTML. If you're lucky, you had some images, and that was pretty much it. But for all the last 10 years, the median size for a desktop web page increased a lot, and I'm talking like 380%. And for a mobile, that's even worse. We're talking like more than a thousand percent increase uh, according to this research in 2021. And I think that understanding this goes through the process of seeing what happened in between. And I'd like to go back in time to the year of 1995 because we had a lot of significant milestones in the technology and web at the time. And I'm of course talking about PHP version 1.0. So the release of PHP, that was supposed to be one, of course. But seriously, this, those CGI scripting languages, they were great. I'm talking like Perl, PHP, etc. Basically, they allowed us to render backend data sources into HTML so we could finally do dynamic data, uh, dynamic size, and sometimes even serving real time data to end users. And this was great. And the reason why all of that was on Servo is because servers were the powerful part of the network at the time. So basically, all the browser had to do was to to write a document and show that, and that is it. That's the work. It was a lot about showing information, not interacting with it. But then JavaScript evolved a lot as a language in browsers in general, but more often as a platform. And we could do a lot of fun things in the browsers. So that's when we started to talk a lot about SPAs and client side rendering. And client side rendering was great. Because we didn't have to go back to the server just to handle the navigation, for example, for more requests. Also, we could cache a lot of stuff. We could cache our main JavaScript or our main CSS model. And as the web got more and more interactive, SPAs and client side rendering became sort of a default way of building things. But then we had another gotcha moment. So suddenly we had to be concerned about, for example, how 
interactivity would go for a user that was downloading our tablet models on the middle of a busy city center using a not great reach connection, etc. And we decided to address this by going back to the server. But this time, we're doing this thing called SSR. And I love this thing by Ricky, one of the four members of React, because he says that SSR should be called server side client rendering, because that's what you do with SSR. You client side rendering the first render on the server. And there's a lot about, about how that relates to hydration and etc. But still, SSR was great because first off the HTML was ready to be displayed. Uh, the HTML was ready to be displayed when the page was loaded. Nice. Also, a lot of things were no longer depending on the browser itself, so you pre-rendered them on the server and you saw some capability issues for certain apps. But still, for interactive websites, we, we needed to send JS, and that's when we got to talk about penetration. So I'm gonna do a little bit of intermission on the topic of penetration here. One of my favorite definitions to address it is that it's a process of attaching behavior to the declarative content to make it interactive. That's the definition by Mishko from Angular and Quick. And hydration comes with a lot of challenges. So you have to associate the DOM elements with their corresponding event handlers, that's the definition. But also, once a user triggers one of these event handlers, you need to update the app state to reflect that. And once the app state is updated, you need to go through the, 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 the framework, needs to go through all your component hierarchy and make sure that it reflects this new state as well. And you don't find a lot of posts out there explaining the challenges and why it's so complex to properly do hydration. But hydration also comes with questions. For example, if you're implementing it, do you send all the JavaScript on every request or you come up with some strategy like sending it by route? And also, you do hydration top down, and if you do that, how expensive is it? And last but not least, how do you orchestrate all of that in a nice developer experience? So it's complex, and hydration also has issues. And the most popular one is this called uh, Uncanny Valley. So it happens when you got your initial request, you got it the HTML and the views painted, but then until the JavaScript arrives and it's parsed, executed, and etc., you had all the moment when things are they can be seen but they cannot be interacted with. And then you display it all every single place, usually you start by getting the HTML, and that's usually fast. But then you gotta download the JavaScript, and this can be slow depending on the network conditions of your users. And then you have to parse and execute JavaScript, and this can also be slow depending on the kind of device they have, I'm talking like low-end devices, and also the amount of JavaScript you're sending. And last but not least, you gotta break our state and bind those event listeners. And this can also be slow depending on the amount of dumb nodes you need to go through, and also the amount of references that you need to rebound to those event listeners. Again, you'll find a lot of posts out there on how on the device behind hydration is so complex and hard to be done, right? But what happened is, throughout the years, people were coming up with strategies to improve that. And items that we start to hear a lot back in training, training, this is just one of them. So, we probably got the name items from this post by Jason Miller, the guy behind React, back in training, training. But if you think about the idea, it's not too different from what we had like in this post back in. So I love this post. It was published in 2013, and it was pretty much attaching JavaScript behavior to channel of HTML to make it interactive and selling that as an optimization. But anyways, items are this component-based architecture that suggests a compromised field of the page with static and dynamic items. So that's what you get. Selectively, progressively enhanced bits of server, render HTML with some client side JavaScript. And you end up with some small focus chunks of interactivity in SSR pages. So it's a bit of a mind shift going from where you have, for example, one single application in control of full rendering of their page to a scenario where you have like multiple entry points. One of the great things about items in general is that they script for the items and be delivered and hydrated independently, which basically allows the rest of your page to be just HTML. And 
that's what the output of each atom should be progressively in that stage now. So the thing with atoms in comparison to other strategies is that usually you have more specificity around how this enhancement occurs. Of course, it's better if we visualize. So let's say we want to have a blog page, a very simple one, where we got the layout, and then our post has a title, it has some content, and at the bottom, we have a comment section and some buttons for social sharing, for example. So if we were to model that with items, for example, our layout would be 100% server side rendering. So it could be the title and the content, because in this block, here's that. You don't need to interact with them. They don't have buttons, that kind of thing. And then at the bottom, the interactive bits of our code, oh, we could have these two items. The comments item, where we have a placeholder that can be server side rendered, and inside that, we have the hydration script itself. And then, in an analogous way, the same thing for the social sharing buttons. Another great thing about islands is that nowadays you have just a bunch of strategies for, and approaches. So, you have standalone solutions for doing islands like Astro, Quick, Marco, and others. You can also do islands with React, with Solid, and Svelte. And I think Marco is a very interesting thing to talk about. So Mark has been around since 2014, and throughout the years, they basically built a very interesting combo where we have streaming rendering for years now, with automatic partial hydration and a very smart compiler that would basically generate optimized code banning on where that would run on clients for the server. And the automatic partial hydration would allow the interactive components to hydrate themselves, and the hydration code, of course, is only shipped for the interactive components. That was back in 2014. Years later, 2021, we got Astro. And Astro, by default, had the idea of, okay, let's not ship JavaScript at all unless we need to. And then also, Astro has a very interesting approach to islands where each item can be loaded in parallel. Astro is also a multi-framework, so basically you can write islands using React, React, Svelte, Vue, and others. And last but not least, I think it's a very clever thing they do when it comes to DX is that they allow the loading strategy, you, you can basically specify the loading strategy for each island individually. So it looks like this. So let's say I'm importing this JSX from React components in Astro. I get their directives. So I can basically do, for example, hydrate that on load or hydrate that when the browser is idle or when the component gets visible to the user, so you have different strategies. And you have a lot of cases for islands, for example. You know, imagine like an e-commerce where you have the product pages and they have static descriptions, static links, a lot of static stuff, but then they can have the interactive bits, for example, the group source of the product or the search bar itself. So those bits of interactivity could be modeled as islands. Or anything that you have to generate a report. Imagine like internet banking, like where the account page has a lot of that stuff, like your list of transactions. But at the same time, you can have the filtering, the searching, all of that like being islands of interactivity. So that's pretty much what's great about islands. In general, you're reducing the amount of jobs of code that is shipped to the users. And by doing so, you're getting faster load times and TTI. And overall, Basically, you have the key content available faster to your users, which is great. Not to mention that you still got SSR, so traditional benefits of SSR, like SEO, you, you're keeping them. I personally see that islands could not be a great fit if you have highly interactive pages. Basically, you could end up with dozens or hundreds of islands, and then you might be missing the whole point of the optimization. So it's always about measuring the real game. Also in 2021, we started hearing a lot about reasonability. And I think that the good way to introduce reasonability is that if we think that a huge part of what we have nowadays to do uh, isomorphic JavaScript started from client only libraries. So if we go back in time, for example, in 2013, we had a lot of posts. This one by Yuri, they got really famous. So they were server side rendering backbone. But a lot of experiments at the time were pretty much like this. Suicide rendering in Angular, suicide rendering in React, or Backbone, or the frameworks at the time. I think that a good way to think about reasonability and which 
is what if frameworks were built from scratch with this idea in mind? So it's insane because in training at lab, we had this thing called Aqua. Have anyone heard about Aqua language? Oh yeah, you have. You know. So basically, Aqua went way beyond just partial hydration. You could basically write your programs and the compiler would slice lines and so of concerns for you. Years later, we got Meteor, and that one got a lot more traction. And Meteor had some of that in mind. And then we got Quake in 2021. And Quake had this idea of resumability, which is about pausing the execution of the server and resuming on the client without having to replay and read out and download all the application logic. So as the name suggests, you do some work, you pause, you resume, and you use what happens during the execution on the server when the application starts the browser. And you do that by attaching all the global event handlers at startup, but you only run necessary code upon interaction. So if you compare that to the traditional hydration, I'm not talking about progressive, partial, etc. In traditional hydration, we have each event handler created uh, before this is even triggered. So that's like an eager approach. Also, all the possible event handlers are created and registered. So it's more like an expected way to think. Not to mention that the client redoes work that happened on the server. And this requires the framework to download and execute the components to figure out their hierarchy. With resumability, we have the opposite. So we have a lazy approach where the event handler creation happens only when it's triggered. And also only the, the triggered events are the ones that are created and registered. And you don't have the client redoing the work because you've just got a lot of information that is serialized and sent over the wire. So the traditional flow they, they use to explain resumability is you start, you display the HTML course, and then you are resuming the state from the execution of the server. And this state that is serialized includes, for example, the event handlers, uh, the state itself, and the component hierarchy. And then, boom, it becomes interactive. So this is what we had with hydration and resumability. Now you might wonder, OK, what if we compare that with islands? So islands bring a lot of great stuff. But with islands, in general, you still have the client resuming work. And things happen at island level. With resumability and wait, you don't have the client resuming work, and you have way more than you so it's like so about a level. If you're interested, Chris, uh, this interest this live stream by Ryan Carniato where he posts Mishko and the idea the idea of resumability and quick for about three hours or so. So it's really fun. But overall, that's what's great about resumability. You tend to have better startup performance um, and it brings other things in the same model because you get better rendering performance because only the chain components are the ones that get re-rendered. You get fine grain lazy loading outside of the box and you have progressive interactivity as you would have with progressive penetration, for example. What I, I don't see it's perhaps not great is it's a general good practice that you have to reload your critical page interactions. So again, depending on the amount of critical page interactions, you might have to reload a lot of stuff and miss some of the optimizations. The second thing is, the only way you can leverage to use resumability per the definition is quick. So because of that, you have too little discussions. And most of the discussions and projects and etc. are around builder.io or the quick community. Um, some would argue that Oracle 6 has some mobility and it's actually, they were basically IDA and KAP at the same time, but still most of the things you're going to see are, are around Quick. But I have to say that I think that Quick is a great example of outside of the box thinking that sometimes is required to solve the problems of the web. And then going backwards and fast forward at the same time, in 2017 and 2022, um, we got a st streaming and selective migration. So starting with streaming, I think that streaming was one of the most overlooked things we got with React 16. Because when React 16 was out, we were talking about hooks, we started talking about suspects, 
we even talked about the new context API, but we were not talking a lot about stream. But stream was there, and some people were even using that in production. But it was last year with React 16 and what's called the Suspense SSR, Suspense SSR in React 16 umbrella, where you have a lot of different Reacts that, that got more popular because it was combined with selecting hydration. But to talk about that, we have to figure out what it was before. So before React 18, hydration in React could only begin after the entire data was fetched and rendered. And because of that, users, they couldn't interact with the page until the hydration was complete for the whole page. So the bottom line here is that the parts of the app that were fast they would have to wait for the slow ones. So again, it's better if you can visualize. So you would have to fetch the data on the server and then you render that and then you get your first couple bytes in the browser, you load the code on the client and you get your FCP and only after you hydrate you get your time to interact with. With React 18 stream SSR and select hydration umbrella, this moves into this. And what we have here is we're using five to node stream, this is this new API from React Node Server, create root and suspense. And basically React is now able to prioritize hydrating the parts of the app that the user interacted with before the rest. And also, because we're talking top and React, the components they can become attracted faster by allowing the browser to do other work at the same time as hydrating the components. So the result is that now React doesn't have to wait for those huge components to load to continue streaming HTML for the rest of the page. And it's good, it's fine, because once it is available on the server, it's going to be streamed and inserted by a script tag and variable base. And actually, a lot of companies, they started to experiment with that. And for sales, they published like a case with some metrics on how they improved some, some of their core web files by rewriting the Next.js web page uh, using string SSR and selective hydration being IMD one of the metrics they improved. At the same time, oh, at the same time um, we were also trying to find solutions performance-wise, but not hacking exactly to perform the hydration problem. And what's called ISG is one example. So incremental stack generation or regeneration is basically an evolution of the gen stack for those who are familiar with it, that tries to address some of the problems we've had with clients and service at random. And this basically allows you to to create a static content without a good page review. We're going to see how this looks like. And it was made very popular by Next. So here is basically the advantage of an ISR. We can go with a, either A or B, where we can opt in for build, get faster build times, or caching more. We're going to see this whole flow. But with Next, this was shipped with this revalidate thing. So here, by doing this in the get static props. Next, we will attempt to regenerate a page either when a new request comes in or at most every 16 seconds. So, that is basically you can visualize like this. The uh, page is generated on the request, <coughs> of course. So, zero. And then, unlike SSR, where the visitor has to wait for the data to cache in, etc. All all by part of the page is served immediately in the cache. And then once the data is resolved, the final page, final new page is cached, and the subsequent visitors will get this cached version, new cache version, immediately. And then even when revalidating the visitor first gets the cached version and then only the updated version. So this is what we probably heard before as stale while we validate, but out of the box in, in Next. And there's, again, a lot of cases around this. So one of them is like a blog or any kind of page where you don't want a new post to require a full review of the other stuff you had before and to rebuild and redeploy and all of that. Or even for huge e-commerce, there are a lot of commerce that use have the same assets and stuff like that, and static generation. And imagine like millions of, uh, or thousands of items. So you don't want a new product or a change to product to cause all of that. And I'm talking like 
hours and hours of CI builds. So that's pretty much what's great. You get a lot of benefits of having static generation plus the advantage of having dynamic content. What would not be great is because then you're adding the server component. So depending on the amount of stuff you're doing in the server, there could be server costs. So you might want to consider that. But to address this, we got what's called on demand and ISR. And by leveraging that, uh, this is done by webhooks or similar strategies. You get everything you have in static generation and create stuff for dynamic content, and you cut a lot of server costs. We also have to talk about server components. So, yeah, we started listening more and more about server components back in 2020. But funny enough, it, uh, it was all, all the time there under the name of Flight. So, React had a lot of awesome projects like Forget, Fire. Player and all these apps, React Fly was there. And 2018, 19, etc. But it was in late 2020 that we got this post from the core team introducing zero bottle size React server components. And after that, especially after we got uh, the app router, I feel like this whole community, like the whole community, has been like this, like trying to piece how they all, how, trying to understand how they all piece together also with other React stuff like suspense transitions and etc. and where's the documentation and so on. So basically the way I like to see server components is as you have a head of time rendering that happen during build or on the server. But not only that, it's also a routing paradigm and a way that is integrated with the way you capture data and the way the framework bottles work out. And oddly enough, it's not directly related to SSR itself or even hydration. So now that we discussed islands, server components can be abstracted in the top of the idea of islands, but the difference is if we remember Astro, if we're using Astro and React, we have a boundary. But we with server components, everything is React. So that's why you have things like this one. Because you need to draw the boundary between the two model graphs yourself. And the other thing about server components is that each component can decide whether it will be a server component or stick to being a server plus line component. And I think that we got three great things about it. First is that the code for server components is actually never delivered to the client, which is different for a lot of SSR implementations that we have these days, including Next.js. I mean, with the idea of router, where a lot of things still get sent by a JavaScript model, anyways, if you inspect that, you will see. And then we got access to the backend tree, uh, to the backend from anywhere within your component tree. So that's pretty much what we do these days with Next in methods like get server side props and etc. But nowadays we're limited to having that at page level. And with server components, you don't have this limitation anymore. And the third thing that's my favorite is that they can be refactored while maintaining the client side state inside of the tree. So imagine like a search bar or something where you have like hovering state, selection state, and all of that, and you can refresh the rebranded components and maintain that. So then recently published one example. So this is a uh, hello world without server components, and you can see that it types something, and then it performs the navigation, and then the state blows away. And then this, this is the same example with server components, where you navigate, and then the state is still there. What I'm particularly concerned about that is that, depending on the scenario, I fear that a lot of data could be sent along the wire on every rig render, but I don't have metrics for that at the moment. For the level of question. Also, I wonder how much orchestration will be needed in the final form for server components because, I mean, people are still shipping server components, server actions, async components, and all of that. So, I wonder what's going to be the final follow up experience you're going to get in the end. And even though it's usually sold out at uh, so that's stable or non binary. It's clear that this whole thing is still experimental. People are shipping into production, of course, but it is still experimental. 
And that's kind of place you can have a lot of options to leverage to create server components other than Next with the app proper. One thing that I do love about server components is that it reminds me a lot uh, of this tweet by Mishko from Angular and Quick, where he said that this whole thing of extracting and collocating clients and server code would be one of the key challenges of the next decade. And I think, I, I agree with him, but I think it has been all along. And it reminds me a lot of this tool called Jaxer. Has anyone heard of Jaxer? Yeah. So Jaxer is a tool from 2008, so more than a decade ago. And if you check the official documentation, this is a post by John Rez, the creator of jQuery. Uh, so it's uh, talking about stuff about uh, Jaxer. And if you check the official docs, you're going to see stuff like that. So you would have these script tags, and the, the tags had this extra run at attribute where you could specify if that piece of code would run on the server or both, for example. And that was built on top of, uh, I think it was a patch, and then it was using Firefox rendering engine under the hood. And it's amazing that if you put the latest documentation of the next app dollar, with this from more than a day ago, you see that, yeah, extracting, collocating, client and server code has been a challenge for a lot of time now. Anyways, I think that a lot of us, myself included, still need to learn a lot about server components and the whole idea needs to get more mature. Um, there's this session by a friend of mine, which is where he basically um, implements a very minimal version of server components from scratch. Um, and of course, there's a lot of interesting resources out there. Uh, then can uh, go to master and all these people have, and, and Ryan himself, all these folks have very interesting lives where they basically discuss the idea and etc. Also there is Waku. So Waku is a project by Daishi Kato. He is the guy behind a lot of interesting state management libraries to state, like Sustan or Jokai or Baltio. So he started implementing Waku, like this is some implementation of server components. And if you add to the Waku documentation, you will find like the, the, the reason behind his technical decisions and stuff like that. So it's a very interesting journey to watch. Not to mention other prolonged implementations. So these days we have OCaml and Gold implementations of React server components. So basically, a lot of folks are experimenting with the idea. Not to mention Blink by Ten. So you probably know Tenor from TenStack Query or TenStack Form or TenStack Router or pretty much any open source it does. So there's Blink, which is not a server components project per se, but it experiments a lot with this whole thing of client and server code allocation and etc. So it, it's it's very interesting to to also check out. And we got the edge. So we hear a lot about the edge uh, in the recent days. And if you check, you'll see even the terminology of edge first frameworks and edge functions, edge computing, all of that. So just your basic topic, edge functions are basically the thing that allows you to serve content from the CDN, so from the CDN server that is closest to the user. So if you compare that to serverless functions, for example, in serverless functions, they will be deployed to specific regions, and they're going to run in these regions regardless of the initiator's origin, for example. Whereas with edge functions, they're going to run as close to the requester as they can on what's called distributed edge server. And that's the thing of edge computing in general, which, by the way, is not new. We started talking recently perhaps around 2017. But this idea of bringing computing tools closer to the source of data and then having fewer processes running in the cloud and etc. because you're basically minimizing the need for a lot of distance communications and reducing latency. It's been used in other systems uh, for a while now, like monitoring systems, security systems, and cloud host systems. And even the idea of CDN, when they were born back in 1998 by Akamai, they, 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 this was the idea. 
Anyway, you search hearing a lot about that when Cloudflare came out with workers. So Cloudflare released their own edge network and also their own JavaScript runtime to Cloudflare workers, uh, which are basically a serverless application platform. And I like a lot this uh, post by the Tino team because they also have their runtime Tino and they have their own edge network as well. And in this post, they compare the time to first buy from this application served from Miracle, and then you got the milliseconds from different locations, and then they run the same, the exact same thing from their Azure network. Of course, they're promoting their stuff, but you could run similar stuff with other Azure networks distributed in the same regions, and you'll see all that. And the truth is that the edge functional support has been rolled up to pretty much any of the math frameworks that we have these days uh, in, in, in the last 12 months or so. So, and it's quite transparent to a lot of us, actually. So, for a lot of times, you can start applying that on the edge and, and you won't even notice. And sometimes, for cell, for example, it makes this just a matter of toggling uh, if an option in, in configuration, of course. If your app suits uh, the constraints of Azure computing and the Azure network you're running on. Well, so yeah, we talked about hydration, streaming SSR, resumability, items, some ways to improve hydration like selective hydration, uh, some ways to improve that generation by doing it incrementally. We surfaced the history of MPAs and how we went from MPAs to SPAs and content rendering and how we start doing SSR to improve stuff, etc. And there's even more. Um, there's, we could talk about more about static rendering, for example. We could explore in scales of partial and progressive migration. Not to mention the new build transitions API that has to create has changed support for it. By the way, um, we had a great talk by Daniel earlier today that explored some of these concepts. Uh, Alba will be following up uh, on the main stage at 4 p.m. But before uh, we close here, I'd like to first talk a little bit about the future. So I think that. We'll be revisiting a lot this thing of MPAs versus SPAs and whether this was a good or a bad move in the community and stuff. So there's a bunch of interesting cases already and takes on that. And I don't want to sound repetitive again, but Brian has a very interesting live stream that is for five hours actually just discussing the whole history of MPAs and SPAs. So you might want to check that. We'll be discussing this a lot. Of course, we'll be talking a lot about hydration and coming up with new ideas or revisiting old ideas uh, to improve or address the challenges of hydration, if not replace hydration at all. And Related to that, we've been discussing a lot of zero kilobyte JavaScript and whether we really want to have that in the whole. And if so, how are we going to do that? Is that by server components, some evolution of islands? I think we've been discussing a lot, I agree with Michelle, we've been discussing a lot of abstraction and at which level and which approach we'll be doing that. So you have Solid doing this one way, Next is doing this with another approach and quick a whole other approach. And I think it's really aligned with what Dan said uh, back in 2019, that the next wave of technologies wouldn't be about putting everything on the client or doing everything on the server, but that would be about letting you move code between them without friction and adjusting the trade-off to each use case. And if you watch the next talk yesterday, for example, you can see that the React and the next team have been thinking a lot about that. Have you seen this thing? It's an ACMA proposal that's called Import Attributes and it's shipped uh, with one of the latest versions of TypeScript as well. It basically allows you to do things like import JSON from full.json with TypeScript. So I wonder 
with the emotions. I wonder if in the future we wouldn't be able, in an analogous way, to import a given component with type bind or with type bold. I, I would love to see this, this kind of solution happening. Sorry? Cycles. 
And it's important that we remember that we're not the first ones trying a lot of the cool stuff you see these days. So it's important that we think, okay, what's different now? Why this didn't become a thing in the back in the day? Or what was really good and just turned out to be hot smart? And I got two examples of this. So uh, this is uh, the tweet by Andrew Clark, one of the core team, uh, core commanders of React. And back in 2018, he was basically showing how a lot of how React works on the hood, the whole reconciliation process and maintaining two versions of the tree and etc. is based on the idea of double buffering, which is a concept that the game development industry has had for decades now. And in an analogous way, in 2021, Dan was saying that basically all of the interesting stuff that the React team had been experimenting in 2018, 2019, 2020 was actually grabbing inspiration from Marco and what Marco was doing back in 2014. And he even links this post, for example, how Marco was doing progressive HTML rendering back in the day. And you even got really interesting sessions by the Marco team you want to see this more. But one thing that is amazing is the post that Dan links from, from the Marco team links to another post called The Lost Mark of Progressive HTML Rendering. And this was published back in 2005. And they were calling that Lost Art. And yeah, I, I, I don't know about you, but I agree that a lot of that sounds incredibly complex. And I think it should. Because basically we're in a momentum where we're trying to address uh, what's uncertain when it comes to the device capabilities, network conditions, and all of other stuff among users. So if we remember back in 2010, we had a similar problem. We just had responsive design. And as front-end engineers, we had to basically do stuff that would work in a predictable amount of screen resolutions, the screen sizes, and that cetera. And that was complex. Sometimes it still is. So yes, complex solutions for really complex problems. Um, you know what they say that a picture is worth a thousand words. So this is one of the latest things I, I want to show you. So this was me about a, almost a decade ago, and I went to this uh, IPS meetup in my hometown, Port Elizabeth. And I was doing native iOS at the time, but I was super hyped with Ionic and Angular. And I was telling them, you know what, you should stop building native iOS apps. Just go with Ionic and Angular, because that's going to be the future. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, don't always trust those future predictions, and speculations, and etc. Because the cliche is true. There's no super bullet. That's why it's key that you identify the core metrics of your apps and you correlate these with your business metrics, things like bounce rates, conversion rates, and etc. Because at the end of the day, your nice, fancy, like home scores and whatever other metrics will matter if you're combining with interesting real user metrics and, and results from, from your users. This is me. You can find me everywhere as White Combinator. I am a senior software engineer in Medallia. Uh, I mentor front end students at Tech Labs. I'm a Google Developer Expert in Performance. Thank you for having me. Muito obrigado.